Welcome to our Compost Basics online workshop. My name is Michael Martinez and I'm the Executive Director of LA Compost. My name is Lynn Fang and I'm the Soil and Compost Operations Specialist at LA Compost. LA Compost is a community-based nonprofit that restores lost connections to the soil and one another. Cooperatively with a diverse network of partners all across LA County, we co-create spaces for compost access and education, regenerative practices, and community empowerment. We support a healthy transition where food is never wasted, but return to the soil for the next cycle of life. You might be wondering, what is compost? Is it my food scraps? Is it the stuff I put in my green bin? Is it soil? Is it dirt? Compost is not soil and it's not dirt. It's also important to remember that all soil is unique and not all soils need compost. Compost is used to describe the decomposition of organic matter over time, feeding the soil when it's finished, um, adding fertility and building soil structure, strengthening the soil to prevent erosion. Compost is both a verb and a noun. It's a verb because it's the process of decomposing organic matter. It's also a noun because it's the finished product of decomposed materials. Compost is an amendment to the soil that activates the microbial life and supports plant nutrition. It helps sequester soil carbon, improves water infiltration and retention, um, and builds microbial life in the soil. Compost is important for many reasons. It reduces food from reaching landfills because there really is no such thing as a way. Food always has to go somewhere and end up someplace. And compost eliminates the need for food to go to landfill and allows this resource to stay in our neighborhoods. It reduces greenhouse gases. When food rots in landfill anaerobically, it releases methane, which is 20 to 30 times more potent at warming the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. Compost builds healthy soils, adding structure and life to once perhaps depleted soil. It improves water holding capacity. It supports your individual or perhaps even community growing efforts. Compost allows us to see things as a resource, as having value, rather than something that is worthless or is considered waste, allowing it to be transformed and brought back into the cycle of life. So how do we do it? How do we make compost? I often like to say that compost is a lot like baking a cake. You are gathering ingredients and creating certain conditions for something beautiful and magical to happen. Here in our hot thermophilic composting, we have four major ingredients. We're going to be briefly going over these four ingredients and how each of them contribute to the composting process. The first two ingredients in composting are air and water. It's important that it's an aerobic process where there's good oxygen flow because that's what our decomposer microbes need to do their work of breaking down organic matter. When organic waste goes into the landfill, there's not enough airflow and it releases methane. So this process, there's a bunch of oxygen flow through the compost pile, and so we don't release methane. So it's important to have different types of sized materials to have good airflow. So you want some bulky materials and some fine materials um, so that you can have good airflow in your compost pile. Water is also very important. Ideally, you want to have 50 to 60 percent moisture content in your compost pile. That ensures that your microbes get the water they need to do their decomposition activity. And having your mix of bulky and fine materials also ensures there's good water uh, penetration throughout the pile. Uh, when you don't have enough moisture, your composting process slows down, the microbes dry out, uh, and your decomposition stalls. So it's important to maintain that moisture level. After air and water, we have our two other major inputs. We classify these inputs by browns and greens, which means they are not just in brown and green in color, but heavy and rich in carbon and heavy and rich in nitrogen. Our greens are all our fruits and vegetable scraps coming from the kitchen. Um, coffee grounds, eggshells, things like that are even classified in greens. When it comes to browns, materials rich in carbon, we have dead leaves, we have our mulches, we have our sawdust and shavings from untreated wood. And there's a variety of other browns and greens that you can find, um, readily available all around your household, that are going to be the two main ingredients. These ingredients provide the protein energy for our microbial life that are the true decomposers of this composting process. 50-50 is typically a safe balance of 50-50 by volume. 50% uh, carbon, 50% nitrogen, your air and water, and your compost process will begin. It's important to remember that anything that was once alive can be composted in the right environment and conditions. Today we're talking about backyard composting, 
which requires us to be a little bit more picky with the ingredients that we actually input into our pile. The four ingredients of the compost process are also the four solutions to any issues that might come up. Your pile's not getting hot enough? Add some more water and food scraps. Your pile might stink? Some air and browns will do the trick. You might think your pile's taking too long to break down? Make sure the moisture content is correct. Ensuring that you have the ingredients balanced will ensure a nice process of decomposition. Decomposer organisms are at the heart of the hot composting process. We prepare for them the right meal that they like to eat. Just as we like to have a healthy diet of protein, fats, carbs, microbes also need that carbon and nitrogen ratio so that they can feast and be healthy and happy. Uh, so we start with a one-to-one -one ratio of browns and greens. Um, and once we do that, add water and there's good airflow, the microbial activity uh, heats up and generates heat in the pile. So when we do hot composting and we balance all of those ingredients properly, we can get up to temperatures of 130 to 150 degrees. And that helps to kill off any human or plant pathogens and weed seeds as well. So when we start building our compost pile, we always want to start with a bed of wood chips at the bottom. Um, and that's important because as you build up the compost, it gets heavy, and so you can maintain good airflow at the bottom. And as the composting process continues, it releases a liquid byproduct that we call leachate. And so the wood chips help to absorb the leachate that's coming out of the compost. Afterwards, we can put in our food scraps as a layer. Um, if we have any other high nitrogen materials like manure, we can add some of that as well. Um, and then here we have some sawdust. We can put a little bit here. Once you have added all of your high nitrogen green materials, then you can cap it again with wood chips on top. So it's important to cap your food waste um, and green materials with wood chips uh, because wood chips help to absorb odors and neutralize odors. It uh, helps to keep moisture inside as well. And then at this point, you'll want to water your pile. Uh, every layer that you build with these wood chip caps, um, you want to water it well. So that way you make sure it gets to the 50 to 60% moisture content. And your compost can take a lot of water, so feel free to be generous with your watering. And then you can continue your layering process like that. Um, and if you have your, all of your ingredients in right balance, it should heat up to about 130 degrees within just a few days. When it comes to storing and depositing your food scraps in your compost bin, if you have the capacity to take it out daily, we highly recommend you do so. For those of you that are storing it in a container under your sink or on your counter, you might encounter some fruit flies or perhaps even odors by day two or three of storing these materials. One helpful tip that we want to share is your freezer. When you place your food scraps in your freezer, you kind of put things on pause. You prevent odors, you prevent fruit flies, and if you've ever placed a glass water bottle in the freezer and seen it shatter, that's because cells are expanding in cold temperatures. When you place your food scraps in the freezer, you're obviously not getting exploding banana peels, but you're actually rupturing some of the cell walls, allowing for the microbial life to have an easier time decomposing this material. It's much easier handling frozen food scraps than two, three, four day old food scraps in your kitchen as well. If you're storing the food scraps over for a few days, we recommend using your freezer. It'll make the process a lot easier. When you're building your compost pile or your bin, it's really important to think about where you're gonna be placing it. If you have shade and you're in Southern California, we'd recommend placing it in the shade. As Lynn mentioned, water is a key ingredient to the compost process. And if your pile or bin is in direct sun, it's oftentimes gonna dry out and slow the decomposition process. This aquarium is just a, is, is just a demonstration. Your bin will have perforated holes or, or, or windows to allow for nice airflow. And if you're in a pile, you're having air inoculate your pile all around. You're gonna continue with this layering process or as some people like to call lasagna compost, where you're placing your food scraps, your greens, your browns, your greens, your browns, always covering with browns as, as Lynn mentioned. A quick easy way to identify how much water you have is a squeeze test. You can grab material, squeeze it, see how well it holds together. Your food scraps contain a lot of moisture to begin with, and when you place them in the freezer, they build up additional frost, only adding more to that water and moisture. By adding water and ensuring proper moisture, you're allowing for prime decomposition conditions to take place. As you layer, you're gonna to begin to see your material lose volume. That's natural. Nothing's taking your compost, no one's stealing your materials. It's breaking down. The macro and microorganisms are doing their job. There's different varieties and different ways in which you can harvest that material. 
but it typically takes anywhere from three to six months and sometimes even a year, depending on how often you are turning, watering, or engaging with your pile. There's a spectrum of composters. There's those that just build the compost pile and let it decompose naturally. And then there's those that are out going out there daily, watering, turning. Do what works for you. Do what works for your capacity. Because if you try to do something that you're not capable of doing, you're gonna burn out and become disinterested. What I always like to recommend is have your ingredients handy. It's nice to have all your materials readily available, having your compost pile next to a water source, having a pile of carbon readily available so that when you are dropping off your nitrogen in your compost bin or pile, you can easily layer as needed. So you might be asking, so what's actually going on? What's breaking down my material? How long does it take? We're gonna jump into the three stages of composting now. So we showed you how to build our demonstration hot compost pile and in that process we've basically prepared a, a wonderful feast for our decomposer microbes um, and the first thing that happens is we enter our what we call mesophilic stage and that refers to kind of ambient temperature. The temperature goes um, up to about 130 degrees and that's kind of where we characterize the mesophilic stage is kind of a fermentation process where a lot of the fermentation um, bacteria and organisms are um, breaking down starches uh, into sugars and acids and things like that. Um, and then the pH is going up in that first uh, stage of the mesophilic process. Um, as that happens, the temperature increases because of all of the metabolic activity of the microbes and they actually make it too hot for uh, those same organisms to survive. And so we enter the thermophilic stage where it stays hot for several weeks, sometimes uh, even up to like two months or so, where it stays at around 130 to 150 degrees um, in our second phase, the thermophilic stage. And so at this time, it's only certain heat tolerant bacteria like Bacillus and Actinobacteria that are most active. Uh, we're really focused on breaking down kind of woody materials, plant cell well materials, the tough fibrate materials, and we're starting to form humus, which is kind of the end product of decomposition. It's that dark chocolatey substance uh, that's very crumbly. That's what we call humus. Um, so we're in this stage for several weeks. Uh, as all that material is being digested, um, you'll see less and less of the original food waste and uh, waste materials that we put into the compost pile. And then as that material gets digested, the microbial activity slows down and then the temperature begins to cool down. And we start entering our third phase of curing and maturation. So the temperature here cools down to about ambient. Uh, you can't see any of the original food waste materials anymore and it's starting to look mostly like humus, basically, finished compost. So compost is finished when it's no longer hot. Uh, we're kind of at cool ambient temperatures at this point. Uh, you see it's mostly a dark chocolate color. You might still have some woody chips and things like that in there and that's okay. Uh, you can sift those out when you want to use that compost. Um, but it's mostly dark chocolate, crumbly kind of material. You can't see any of the original food waste or other waste material that was in there. Um, and at that point, it's pretty much ready to be used in the field. Uh, you can use it to amend your vegetable beds uh, when you're planting or when you're building up your new beds. You can put in a half inch layer of compost on top. Uh, you can also use it to make compost tea, which is, adds a boost of fertility to your plants um, and also helps protect against plant diseases. After the curing and maturation process and after you've sifted, it's important to pull out any contaminants that you may find. These include produce stickers, rubber bands, zip tie, twisty ties, and even some compostable packages that oftentimes don't break down in a backyard system. Uh, it's unfortunate that we find these in most of our piles, but it's also important for you to remove them because the last thing you want to be doing is adding microplastics or smaller plastics into your soil when you are top dressing your garden beds with your finished compost. We hope you learned a lot from this video workshop on composting, and if you have any more questions, you can email us at info at lacompost.org. Additionally, we have a downloadable compost guide, both in English and Spanish, that will review most of the key terms that we mentioned during this workshop. We hope you enjoy, and from all of us at LA Compost, happy composting. <laughs>